Down in the city streets, we see a man making a mad dash to escape something. But just when he starts to think he may be safe, shadowy figures begin to emerge from the smoke. And while he doesn't know how they knew it was him, he knows he is about to get jumped for sure. They throw smoke grenades on the ground and from that smoke, men in all black emerge to attack him. However, this guy is no pushover as he single-handedly takes down an entire squad of armed soldiers, with nothing but his bare hands. The men in black begin to launch sharp needles at him, but he dodges them while doing backflips and pulls out a knife so he can start counterattacking. He then proceeds to stab the next few ninjas that attack him before continuing his attempt to escape. It looks like we've got ourselves a really good main character, but things start taking a downward spiral as he gets stabbed in the neck by a knife. He got stabbed some more, but I'm sure he'll be fine. I was wrong, he has been decapitated, and the leader of the ninja squad takes a picture to confirm his death and a successful mission before he leaves to return back to base with the rest of the ninjas. Elsewhere on a farm, this man is living the simple life of a farmer and you can tell he enjoys every bit of it. After loading his truck with corn, he drives off to return to his house and by evening, he's spending some time fixing up his motorcycle. He then notices someone approaching him, so he turns around with his soot-covered face and finds his little boy trying to scare him. The boy jumps into his father's arms after he was found out, and his wife soon comes out to join them. And I hate to be that guy, but if that's his wife, this guy's life is way too good for nothing bad to happen. Once they've had dinner and their son has gone to bed, the man is cleaning up the dishes while his wife watches the news and sees a report of the incident of a man being murdered in a back alley. The corpse seemed to have several stab wounds and was decapitated, so the people speculate that it may have been the doing of a criminal organization. This gets the attention of the two as his wife wonders if this was done by the people she thinks. Their son comes back into the room, but this is a serious discussion, so they don't want their son hearing about this. The man goes to put the boy back to bed, and while walking back to the living room, he checks the security cameras he has set up all throughout the farm to make sure they are still safe here, and nothing shows up, so he calms down a little. He gets back to his wife and asks her what's wrong, so she explains that she is worried about the way that guy in the news was killed. And not just that either, as even after doing extensive research on him, there was no information found about what that dude does in his personal life. Which could just mean he's an otaku. But Mary believes otherwise. The man tries to calm her by saying no one would ever find them here, so there's no reason to be so worried, yet she is still concerned that the Reaper might locate them. The man assures her that this wasn't the work of the Reaper because the Reaper always worked alone, but this was clearly a coordinated jumping, so there really is nothing to be worried about. They go on with their family life as normal, having fun and bonding together. But once everyone is asleep, the man makes sure to keep vigilant and patrol the grounds to make sure his family stays safe. The murders continue happening in the city and local authorities are stumped because they know it has the same characteristics as the past three similar occurrences. But there are still no clues or connections between the different victims that they know of. That night, when everyone has gone to bed, there is an ominous red color outside and the man gets up because he feels like something is wrong. He tells Mary to stay in bed for now while he goes to deal with it. So he heads downstairs into the living room and looks out the window. With a second glance, we see those ninjas standing there just staring him down, but now that he has been noticed, they smash through the window and throw their spikes at him. The man dodges them and gets himself ready to take down the intruder as they come at him with swords. The fast-paced action continues as the man slashes away at the ninjas and kills them mercilessly. But then he hears the voice of his son screaming upstairs, so he gets distracted and nearly has his head taken off. He manages to break away and tries to run upstairs to get to his son. But with his back turned, he gets stabbed through the throat by some of those needles and falls to the floor. He is still trying to drag his body up the stairs, but the poison is starting to get to him, so he is much slower in his reactions than earlier. He staggers over to the bedroom to get to his family. But what he finds there is truly horrifying. While his wife did put up a great fight in taking out a bunch of ninjas, she was ultimately overwhelmed and has been slain by the ninjas. And this one must have been personal, because the ninja team leader is smiling like he is really proud of himself as he stabs her neck once more to really let it set in that she's dead. The man is overcome with grief, so even after he gets stabbed in the back with tears in his eyes, he continues trying to make it to his wife and son. But he soon falls over dead from his injuries. One of the ninjas looks out the window and realizes the cops have already shown up at the crime scene, which was pretty quick considering this is a farm in the middle of nowhere. The leader checks the man's pulse to make sure he is dead and satisfied with his results. He tells his team to pack the bodies of the dead ninja and leave before the cops enter and discover the dead bodies of the man and his family. The man's body gets taken to a morgue, and while lying there awaiting an autopsy, he suddenly opens his eyes and crawls off the table. Then the memory of his wife and son being killed comes back to him as he is sprawled out on the floor. He can't take it, so he ends up vomiting and passing out again. 
But the next time he wakes up, he finds himself in a hospital bed after the more workers must have realized he is still alive. The nurses that were watching over him are shocked that he has woken up, so they immediately rush to go call a doctor over as he goes unconscious again. Later, Logan has regained consciousness once more and is being asked if he remembers anything that happened before he got here. He miraculously came back to life after the coroner had pronounced him dead, but what he really wants to know is if his wife and son managed to come back to life as well, but unfortunately, they weren't as lucky as him. Outside in the hospital corridor, a detective is on his way to meet Logan to ask him some questions. It had been over 24 hours since Logan was pronounced dead that he will cup, so his partner is questioning whether he is even still human at this point. The detective doesn't want to think about all that, so he just enters the room to have his interrogation. He introduces himself to Logan as Mike Morris from the FBI, while his partner introduces herself as Emma Samanda. They ask him for his help in the investigation related to the recent string of murders, of which he was the latest victim. He understands this must be a very difficult time for him, but any information he can give, like the people who did this or their motive behind doing so, would go a long way towards solving the case once and for all. Logan doesn't say anything, but he clenches his fist tightly, so he clearly knows something that is making him angry. So since he isn't ready to talk yet, Mike leaves him with his business card in case he ever wants to share anything later. He then leaves with Emma, but as they walk down the halls, he tells her that he believes Logan knows exactly who did this to him. It's just a hunch, but if he is right, then they had better take turns watching his room tonight, so Emma reluctantly agreed, although she isn't happy about the overtime sting operation she now has to do. Late into the night, Emma reports to Mike that Logan has been up on the roof, just sitting there for a while now. She won't make any moves unless Mike asks her to, but she finds his behavior strange. He is looking over the edge of the roof while thinking about what has happened to his beloved family. They killed his wife, and they killed his son. He may not have had a dog to be killed, but rage is building up in him like never before, so he pulls out a spike from his wrist and stabs himself in the shoulder with it. He begins to shake violently, but then dodges out of the way of an incoming rain of spikes from the ninjas as he was expecting them to eventually come to finish the job. They charge at him just like last time, but despite being hospitalized, his movements are much sharper than they were when he was first attacked, so he's able to quickly dispatch all the ninjas that have come after him. Even pulling out some ninjutsu to turn into a cloud of black smoke and beheading eight ninjas at once, Emma can't believe what she has just witnessed, so she does the smart thing and tries to leave, however, Logan was already on to her spying on him, so as she is leaving, she gets backhanded into a concussion. He then steps over her body and towards the remaining ninja army that are here to claim his life. He takes calm, cool, and collected steps while he casually slicing up the ninjas who are now attacking him in single file for some reason. After he has killed a bunch of them, he throws the sword into the elevator button and picks up a staff one of the ninjas was using before using it to ram the remaining ninjas into the elevator with him. His vision is blurry, but that isn't stopping him from massacring these ninjas while they are trapped with him in the elevator. By the time the elevator door opens on the bottom floor, Logan is standing on a pile of corpses, and you know this ninja is regretting his career path right now. We don't see what he does to them. But by the time Mike had come in to find out why Emma wasn't answering her phone, he saw the pile of dead bodies, while Logan is elsewhere finishing off the last one. The only person left is the ninja leader who personally killed his wife and son. So Logan is even angrier than he was before as he charges in, and the two clash swords. The leader then uses a wire to catch Logan and throw him around, but he breaks free to continue the clash. It was looking like the two were evenly matched in skill, but then Logan used his smoke ability again and managed to stab the leader through the abdomen once. And from there, it was all downhill for the ninja leader as he gets stabbed repeatedly and tossed on the floor to be finished off. But before he does, Logan asks him how they managed to find him here even after all the precautions he took. The ninja squad leader smugly answers that no matter where he hides or how many times he changes his face, it will always be able to find him because there is no escaping them. Logan realizes the guy is right, so he takes off the face-changing mask he had on and finishes him off. Afterward, he goes to see the corpse of his wife and son one last time and faces his failure to protect them. He later returns to his farmhouse and digs into his wall to recover the tools from the life he left behind long ago. He and his wife had moved here and changed their identities to escape their bold life, even had a son and lived in peace for a few years. But the past came back to bite him. So he burns down his house along with the painful memories of his family and prepares to that old life and make them pay for what they've done. Long ago in Japan, the ninja clan worked in secrecy to maintain order within the country, with one main rule that people within the organization must never share any of the skills learned here with foreigners under any circumstances. However, due to events involving a plane and two towers, they changed their policy to maintain order throughout the entire world, so by proxy, 
was now allowed by the organization for foreigners to learn their secrets. The goal of benefiting Japan always remained. Under the new management, anyone who disobeyed orders or disliked the new way of doing things was deemed a defector and would be excommunicado. They would subsequently be hunted down and eliminated, just as we've seen happen to Logan, whose real name is apparently Hagen. He snaps out of his nightmare and we see he had been torturing the ninja team leader to get information, but the strain on his body was too great, so he ends up collapsing on the ground. Just then, he hears the familiar voice of an old geezer who he had never thought you would see again in this lifetime. The old man is a Dr. Hagen had been going to back in the day, so having heard about what happened to his family, he offers his condolences. He also asks why Hagen isn't wearing his disguise right now, so Hagen informs him that the organization has found a way to find them even with the disguises on, so he's now completely useless. That's bad news, but changing topics, the old man complains about Hagen always being beaten up so badly when he sees him. But then again, he is a doctor, so Hagen only comes to see him when he is injured. The old man takes a look at his arm and can tell that he used his secret art of stark awareness during a fight, which left his arm in its current bruised state. He warns him that if he uses it again, it would be the end of him. But then he takes a look at Hagen's back, and with a wound like that, he should have been dead already. Personally, he doesn't understand why he is alive either, nor does he even want to be alive, but whether it was dumb luck or something keeping him alive, Hagen just wants to get out there and get his revenge. The doctor tells him that even with how strong his body is, it would still take him at least a week before he could make a full recovery, but Hagen doesn't have one week to wait, he just needs to be able to move again and then he will go out and get some answers from those uninvited guests. And after he does, he will hunt down every last person that was involved in what happened to his family. The doctor thinks it is crazy to attempt to take them down by himself, but that's not going to stop him from trying. The doctor agrees to do as he requested, so Hagen is knocked out with a needle, and by the time he wakes up, he has been successfully patched up enough to restore bodily functions, and he even left a care package of essentials behind for him. Hagen takes a look in his backpack and finds that business card that Mike left for him back when he was in the hospital, but he'll leave that for later because right now he's got a date with that ninja team leader. He begins stabbing him in the gut with a knife several times, causing the ninja great pain, but he says this isn't going to be enough to break him into giving up information because ninjas are training to never crack under torture. Hagen knows that to be true, but this isn't about getting information out of him, this is nothing more than revenge for what he has done. So Hagen spends hours stabbing the ninja over and over again until it is morning. Two days have passed of being stabbed over and over and Hagen is finally ready to end it, so he splashes the guy with a jerry can of gasoline which wakes him up. The ninja starts trying to mess with Hagen by recounting how much he enjoyed stabbing his wife to death. Hagen cuts him off and lets him know that he is about to be plunged into the depths of hell, and even if his heart stops, he won't be freed from the torment that awaits him. He then drops the match and watches as the fire engulfs and burns his body into a mass of char. In the FBI headquarters, Mike is pissed because he is getting taken off the investigation despite all that happened. Emma got knocked out and the entire roof was covered in a bunch of human-flavored red paint, so something illegal clearly happened there. Still, the chief says there is nothing they can do since they don't know who that blood belongs to and the surveillance cameras weren't working either, so there's no way to know what happened. More importantly, the head people at the top told them to give up on the investigation, so they have to do as they were told. Mike is still defiant though because they do know what happened there since Emma saw the entire thing with her own eyes, and knows Logan was attacked by assassins. However, his boss corrects him and says he is sure Emma will now agree that she hallucinated the entire thing. Mike goes over to Emma and yells at her for selling out and agreeing to pretend none of that happened. But she had no intention of giving up on the case, she just acted like it to get management off her back. In reality, she's been doing research into the past of Logan on the company computer, which may not be a good idea if you're trying to hide it from management, but she did find something strange. Logan, as well as his wife and kids, were all using aliases as there are no records of them ever existing. Something shady is definitely going on, and Mike is going to get to the bottom of it. Meanwhile, Hagen has begun to travel around the country to locate to look for the people he wishes to take revenge on. He goes to several different locations, but he comes up empty-handed each time no matter where he looks. Eventually, he ends up in a bar located in the middle of nowhere, where there is no such thing as body cams, so the police out here are free to do all the harassment and extortion they wish. The bar owner gives them all the money he has, but they aren't satisfied and start beating him up when the other cop notices Hagen sitting there, quietly drinking his beer, and he decides it is time to add a new victim. He starts accusing Hagen of having stolen the motorcycle he drove here, so naturally, he will have to take the bike, as well as everything Hagen has in his wallet. 
Hagen tries to ignore him so he won't have to get involved, but the cop starts getting violent so he has to put him in his place and knocks the guy out in one second. He then turns to leave, but the other cop wasn't smart enough to know when to back off, so he tried to hit Hagen with his baton and take a look at this. Hagen didn't even touch the dude, but the force from his punch was enough to launch him back into the wall. Now that that's taken care of, he heads out and remembers that business card Mike gave him, so he may decide to give him a call after all. Over in the FBI office, Mike is complaining about Emma spending so much time playing with that VR headset she has, but she has an excuse to do this because there have been drug deals taking place in games like Minecraft, so she's got to do a thorough investigation on this now, otherwise, they won't have time to looking into the case with Logan anymore. Just then, Mike receives a call from an unknown number, and when he answers, it is Hagen on the other end who introduces himself as Joe Logan. Mike immediately chucks a book at Emma so she'll get off the game and start tracking where the call is coming from, and in the meantime, he'll try to keep him on the call long enough to triangulate his position. He knows Logan is just an alias, so he asks who he really is, but Hagen wishes to talk in person and is already onto their trick of trying to track him down, so he destroys the phone and calls back with another one. He tells them this is their last chance to gain his cooperation, so he tells Mike to pick a location for them to meet. Mike is surprised he is willing to let him choose the location, but since it's his choice, he picks a local Chinese restaurant. That night, Hagen heads into town and climbs a building to scope out the location Mike picked to make sure it isn't an ambush. Meanwhile, Mike has just entered and informs the owner that he's about to use his restaurant as a meeting place with a guy who single-handedly wiped out an assassin army. He thinks this place is perfect, because the business is so slow that there are barely ever any people here. But he's going to need the owner to take a long walk while he is here so they can be alone. The owner doesn't like the idea, but once Hagen shows up, he takes one look at him and knows he doesn't want to be around for what happens next. But before he goes, he tells Mike that he is going to be liable for anything he breaks in the restaurant. Mike wants to see Hagen's face to make sure he's the same guy, but he isn't willing to go that far, so he is about to leave. Mike calls him back and tells him to grab a seat so they can talk. He's taking a big risk coming here so they can talk, but he isn't really interested in talking right now, he just wants to get some information on who the people who killed his wife and son were. However, Mike was never going to negotiate with Logan in the first place as he gets up and points his gun at him. Logan is still calmly waiting in his seat because he knows that the gun isn't going to do any damage to him, but Mike still believes he has the high ground and orders Logan to get on the ground. Just then, the door opens and a delivery guy walks in to grab an order, so Mike is forced to put the gun away for now, yet Logan is still sitting there patiently waiting for Mike to finish so they can keep talking. The door opens again, but this time it's not a regular delivery driver and this bootleg door dash employee dashes at Hagen to take him out, but gets stopped as Hagen turns around and chucks a chair at him. He then pulls out a knife as the two begin fighting in the middle of the restaurant. Mike is still standing there and threatening the two of them to stop with his gun, and I've got to give him credit because he managed to actually dodge one of the attacks from the door dasher. However, as Mike fires his gun at him, he deflects the bullets and comes in close, so it's not looking good for Mike's chances of survival. Luckily, Hagen still needs him alive, so he gets saved from getting delivered to the afterlife. The door dasher has a second set of hands for twice the fighting capacity, so Hagen pulls the same trick and uses his smoke technique to create two extra sets of hands on his back, and with the extra attack speed, he's able to overwhelm the door dasher and knock him back. In a turn of events, there was another door dasher hiding in the backpack, so Hagen now has to face the two of them. He gets Mike to safety first, then he uses some fire to distract the two before pinning one's hand to the wall and stabbing his head with a knife. The other one has already had his head chopped off, so now that the battle is over, Mike has given up on arresting Hagen, and just wants to know who he really is. Hagen explains to him that he is a ninja, as well as all the people behind those murders that were happening recently. Mike had heard rumors about ninjas on the streets, but he never thought they could actually be real. Soon after, the shop gets hit by a drive-by shooting that is trying to kill off all the witnesses, so they hide behind a table for cover, and I don't know what that is made of, but it's gotta be good if it took heavy gunfire and is still in one piece. The shooters then pull out an RPG, so Hagen and Mike run to hide in the back as they fire and leave. By the time the dust has settled, Hagen has disappeared and Mike is left with several questions and a bill for the repair of the restaurant. He goes over to inspect the weapon of the door dasher, and he has no idea what kind of weapon tech they have to be able to slice through his body armor so cleanly. Just then, an advert for the world's leading tech company begins to play, so it looks like they have a hand in all of this. Elsewhere, the head of the clan receives a report that Hagen is unfortunately still alive, so he's going to have to work harder if he wants him dead. 
In an art museum on the other side of the country, we watch as the exhibits are painted red with blood as there are several killings occurring simultaneously this night. Outside, a man is being carted away by his security guards as they try to ensure his safety by getting him as far away from here as possible to escape the calamity that is coming for him. It looks like they may be in the clear, so while in the back seat of the car, the man prays to God to save him from the demons that are after him. And he wasn't joking when he said demons because moments later, these wrinkly white hands pop out from behind his car seats and proceed to snap the necks of the two guards next to him before digging their nails into his head and forcefully disconnecting him from life. The car ends up spinning out of control from all the chaos and crashing into a tree. Moments later, the car bursts into flames, so we know with certainty that everyone in there has died. This whole assassination plan was the work of this bald little midget, and he receives his next target for assassination, Hagen, and he is way too excited to do this. We later see him having a fancy dinner with his boss, and with a full view of his face, we see that he is not actually bald, but he might as well be with that abomination of a haircut. He tells his client that the last job he went on was unbelievably boring since he wasn't even able to get hard as he watched the bodies burn to ash. He needs something more invigorating, so he asks that the boring jobs to the others so he can have some fun. Yamaji is having none of his blabber and tells him he is to kill who he is told to kill as the job isn't meant to be fun. Seeing that he got off to a bad start, the midget backtracks and changes the subject by asking Yamaji if it is really necessary to keep the ninja customs and spend so many resources going after the defecting ninjas, but Yamaji insists that it is a necessary course of action since those defectors are no longer considered ninja, and thus must be exterminated in order to ensure their secret arts are never shared with the public. The midget has to admit that he finds Hagen to be very tempting as a target. He was one of the greatest ninjas ever known to Japan and has mastered countless fighting arts. He is known to be merciless when it comes to killing his targets, and now the midget gets the honor of killing him personally. Yamaji informs him that they have already successfully killed Hagen once before, that he is still alive and well so they suspect he may have used some kind of secret ninja art to bring himself back to life. The ninja secret arts are special techniques that only the old ninjas could use, but that just makes the midget even more excited to face him. The organization needs to make sure they finish him off next time. So preparations are being made at this very moment to ensure he is killed properly this time, but the midget thinks it would be much better if he just left the killing of Hagen for him to handle alone since he is practically edging to get a good lick at him. He begins to leave on his booster seat when he remembers something he wanted to ask about and proceeds to inquire about another ninja called the Reaper. We get a look at this reaper as he has just finished taking out a bunch of ninjas and faces his former master. The master calls out to Zai and tells him brandishing his blade without pride and what he does is nothing more than violence. Zai has been killing the defected ninjas for the organization who also happen to have been his former comrades but the organization is corrupt to the core, so the only reason they are going through so much effort to kill the ninjas that defected is because they fear them. The former master prepares his sword for the inevitable clash and continues by saying the ninjas who chose to hold onto their pride like him and Defect will not fall to the likes of them, and the fact that they failed to kill Hagen is proof of that. The tension rises as the two stare each other down, waiting for someone to make the first move. The master breaks the deadlock first and unleashes a powerful strike of wind which should have been unavoidable, however despite using his secret art, Zai remains unharmed and emerges from the dust with his casual demeanor. The master doesn't know how he managed to dodge that strike, but doesn't matter because he can just perform another one. However, before he redoes his strike, he takes a second look at Zai and realizes this dude isn't holding his sword anymore. And I don't know when he did it, but the sword in question is currently in the middle of the master's sternum. His mask is also destroyed and the master can't even be mad about it because he got beaten before he even knew it. He just says I guess I'm dead as he falls to the ground, saying if he falls into the pits of hell, he'll be waiting for the day Zai joins him down there. Back to the meeting with Yamaji, the midget thinks the reaper must be wanting to go after someone as powerful as Higgin as well, and that may be true. But Yamaji has already issued an order to him forbidding any kind of engagement with Higgin, so they are not allowed to fight at all. Meanwhile, at the police department, we see how badly Mike screwed over the Chinese restaurant guy because after the destruction that broke out there as a result of his meeting, the police department decided to frame the owner as part of a Chinese money laundering scheme to pin the blame on somebody. Mike knows the accusations are a complete lie, but this guy couldn't care less what upper management tells him to lie about as long as he gets to keep his job. There is nothing Mike can do in this situation, and he soon gets called out by his boss. They head out to a lake in the nearby park where his boss tells him to keep his nose out of this stuff. He won't be able to keep his out of trouble if he keeps digging so deep, and he has only got a few more years before retirement so he should just keep his head down until then so he can sit back and drink whiskey while fishing for the rest of his days. His boss will even gift him a state-of-the-art fishing rod, 
But Mike isn't too receptive to the GIF as he knows it's probably going to be an AUZ product, and he doesn't want to give up on finding the truth. His boss is done talking to him and does the only thing he can think of to keep Mike from sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. He tells him not to come into work anymore since he's clearly too tired to make any wise decisions, but he isn't fired just on paid leave until his retirement day. This is the best advice he can give him as someone who used to be partners with him. Elsewhere in an abandoned building, we see Hagen as he is blacksmithing something and hammering away. As he stares blankly into the flames, flashes of the memory of his dead family fill his mind, and it is so overwhelming that he ends up puking his guts out in the corner over there. After the panic attack subsides, he steadies his breathing and calms down before noticing that someone is approaching. A car pulls up to the building and once it is parked, Mike walks out with a box full of stuff. He complains that this place was way too remote for him to find with his GPS, so it took him a lot of effort to get here. But Hegan likes it that way since that means no one would ever come here. The two head inside and have a discussion about the blades that the attackers were using back in the restaurant. After analysis, it seems like they were made with a special alloy, and this special alloy is only produced by Auze, so it is plain to see that there is some kind of connection between them and the ninjas that attacked. Mike says he will do a little digging to see if there is anything he can find, but Auze is most definitely very dangerous since they have the entire FBI under their control and now they want to try to keep him quiet. Hagen tells Mike that they killed his family, so he is going to hunt down every last person there and make them pay for what they did. That means Hagen is planning to murder them all. But just to make things clear, Mike is still on the side of justice, so if it comes down to it, they'll have to arrest Hagen for his crimes, but with that being said, there are still a lot more dirt bags at the FBI that he's going to need to handcuff first. Mike suggests that the two form a truce so they can help each other accomplish their goals, although he had never thought he would be working with anyone as shady as an actual ninja. Hagen hands him a mug and pours him a drink from his flask to commemorate their alliance. But as Mike takes a sip, he realizes what he just drank isn't alcohol so it might have been poison, but Hagen reassures him that it was just an energy drink. Moving on, Mike brings up the fact that he has got a lead on Auze, which gets Hagen's attention. He also says he has someone on their way here who knows a thing or two about them. The door creaks open, so he thinks it must be them, but in reality, it's the duck they are going to be eating soon. That night, Emma finally arrives, but Mike is upset at her for being so late when she was meant to meet up with them at noon. She defends herself by saying she had no choice since she had to wait for a chance to leave work, and then she had to go pick up this baby, so she would get all the way out here. Mike doesn't see what's so special about her car, but Emma takes great offense to him not appreciating the greatness of her baby, so she points out that the car Mike brought is an actual piece of junk. Mike doesn't deny it, but he says the car was good enough to get him here on time, so he doesn't see what the problem could possibly be. Hagen takes a look at Emma's car and can tell that it's one of the best cars made by famous designers back in the 20th century. She is elated to see someone else understand her love for this car as well as expected of a ninja. Hagen is on edge since her knowing that means Mike must have told her, but Mike calms him down by saying Emma is a trusted friend, and also the one who analyzed the weapons for them. So she needs to be here. She has always been fascinated by ninjas, so she starts asking Hagen a ton of questions, but Mike cuts her off and says they should get back on topic since they are here to discuss AUZ. She tells them to get into the car because she has something she wants to show them, so they both squeeze themselves into the back seats, however, there is very little space in there. Emma tells them to bear with it for a second while she shows them why she cares so much about this car, and it is because she has basically turned it into a moving computer, and from this car, she is able to access all the information from around the world. But the real question is, can it run Cyberpunk 2077? Anyway, Emma has researched the company, and has been able to find out that AUZ is involved in the development of military weapons, telecommunications, and entertainment. They are involved in pretty much every kind of technology imaginable, and basically, everyone in the world uses something made by them at this point. But, as with any multinational trillion dollar company, there are dark rumors surrounding the company. So far, every single opposing company leader or journalist that did anything that would put AUZ in a bad spot has died in a mysterious accident. In more recent news, this man who is the leader of a conservative party in his country refused to allow any foreign companies to do business there. But his ruling was recently revoked after he died in a car accident. And the guy who replaced, who definitely isn't an AUZ spy by the way, is currently advocating for the improvement of the domestic technology in partnership with AUZ. All these convenient deaths seem suspicious, and Emma believes this is the work of the ninjas. Mike is worried about what they might be getting into if they are up against a giant company and a ninja army. 
Meanwhile, over in an AUZEA research facility, they have just begun tests for a new generator that they have been developing, and their other wireless power systems are on their way to being perfected, so AUZEA is on its way to becoming commonplace in the world, with the ultimate goal of holding a complete monopoly on all tech industries. The company president heads back to his office after meeting with the researchers, and Yagami is there to meet with him. He's happy to have a chat, but Yagami is here to settle a grievance he has with him. The drive-by that was targeted at Hagen was done by Eiuze agents because he wanted to test out his new weapons, but Yamaji doesn't like him interfering in his business even if they are meant to be business partners. Hagen and the others take a look at the figurative center of Eiuze and try to figure out how the ninjas fit into all of this. The headquarters is located in Eiuze City, where they test out all their experimental inventions. They continue looking through the information when all of a sudden Hagen pushes Mike out of the way as a sword is stabbed through the roof of the car. Emma begins driving to try to shake off their attacker, but he is still jamming the sword into the roof. Mike tries shooting at him, but it isn't doing much to stop the attacks, so Hagen takes it upon himself to stab the guy. They think they are safe now, but out of nowhere. A truck collides with them and they are sent barreling off to the side of the road. Hagen is the first to wake up and the other two are unconscious from the collision, but the battle isn't over as the attacker is standing in front of them and starts firing dozens of spikes at him. Hagen pulls Mike to safety and leaps out of the car to face the mask-wearing attacker, so the two begin to clash while dashing across the city streets. They end up on the roof of a building and the attacker whips out some tentacles robotics that it had equipped, which once locked on, all strike at Hagen until he gets struck in the back midair. He uses his ninjutsu to form extra arms in his back against and grabs the tentacles before using them to toss the attacker around. But he had even more tricks packed into his suit as he launches two missiles at Hagen. However, Hagen managed to dodge them all mid-air and uses the opening to stab the assailant through the head and drag his body to the edge of the roof before pulling off the camera on him. The midget was watching the whole thing and Hagen makes it clear that he is coming for him next. The midget is finishing up his meal and Hagen is about to leave as Mike and Emma are taken away by paramedics. But he suddenly gets a call on a throwaway phone, and it's a voice he seems to recognize. This was the end of episode 3. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.